uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Boutrous, that you have a scheduling matter to take up? But Your Honor, actually it was a, uh, an issue concerning um, something that Mr. Thompson said, and I wanted to just make sure that the record was clear on, on an issue concerning the withdrawal of the expert witnesses by the proponent. Mr. Thompson had said that they withdrew their expert witnesses because of the, the, the witnesses' concerns about the cameras. And I just wanted to make it very clear on the record that not one time did the proponents suggest that in anything that they filed in the court that the withdrawal of those witnesses was because of the cameras. They, they, in fact, they withdrew them after the Supreme Court had granted the temporary stay, which I think undermines the credibility of that statement. And um, it, we had predicted um, back at the pretrial that they would be seeking to withdraw their expert witness, witnesses because of the cross-examination that had occurred and that would occur. And, and I wanted to make that, that clear on the record. And also, we will be playing some clips later today, time permitting, of, of two of those experts. Very well. Thank you, Your Honor. Your now, Honor. is there a scheduling matter that you want to take up? I, I don't think we have a scheduling matter, but let me, let me make sure with my colleagues. Is there anything we... I think we're okay. We had a potential issue, but I think we've got it resolved. Thank you. All right. And, and Your Honor, I just uh, would like to respond for the completeness of the record to what Mr. Boutro said. We, in our papers, advised uh, that our witnesses had significant concerns about the televising, and we only had a temporary stay when trial commenced, and Mr. Boutros uh, and the plaintiffs exacerbated our concerns when they asked that the recording continue on Monday morning. So I think the record is quite clear as to the chain of events. All right. Well, um, wait a minute before you start. Um, let me ask a couple of questions. Yes, Your Honor. And then if you want to follow up, Mr. Thompson, uh, you can. Uh, Dr. Lamb said that, if I understood your testimony correctly, that there's not a basis that the absence of a genetic relationship increases the likelihood of adverse outcomes for children. That is, the absence of a genetic relationship between the child and the parent. Was that your testimony? It was, yes. Right. Well, purely a layperson's question. Why then is it common, or at least said to be common, that adopted children often seek out their biological parents? Um, uh, I think that that's because many of them, of course, know that they are adopted and feel that there is something important about their origins that um, uh, might be revealed by finding their biological parents. Um, uh, that wouldn't be viewed as an index of, of maladjustment, um, but would be viewed as something that, that reflected an individual you know, trying to understand literally where they came from, in the same way that, for example, many people are interested in genealogy and, and want to know a little bit more about their family histories. But that phenomenon, you say, would not have any relationship to any social behavior on the part of those children, is that correct? That, that's what the data suggests, yes. You also testified, if I understood your testimony correctly, to say that there's no reason to protect children from lesbians and gays. We've all read about the uh, reports of widespread uh, priestly abuse in the Roman Catholic Church and the litigation that has been spawned by uh, those reports. How do you square your statement with that phenomenon? Well, um, you know, the, the data with respect to um, sexual abuse, and I assume that's what you mean when you, your focus here is on that protection there, um, uh, shows that, that individuals who have a same-sex orientation are no more likely to abuse other children. That doesn't mean that they don't sometimes abuse other children. Uh, sorry, abuse children, um, uh, and just as heterosexuals do abuse children. Um, uh, in the, and I'm not familiar with all the, the details of the um, abuses conducted within, um, within religious orders. I do know, for example, that many of the cases in Ireland that have recently been disclosed in a huge multi-volume report um, involve um, heterosexual abuse by religious individuals, 
Um, and I assume, again, and, um, I'm assuming because I don't know the details here, that so the abuse that you're talking about involves both heterosexual and homosexual abuse. Um, uh, and I, I don't want to convey the fact that, that homosexual people never abuse children, simply that they're no more likely to do that than are heterosexual individuals. Study that subject. Um, I've studied it in, in terms of, of trying to know what is in that literature. My, my own work on child abuse is mostly about the effects of abuse and the interviewing of the victims. So you focused on the, the children more than the individuals who were thought to be the abusers. Is that correct? In, in terms of my own research on child abuse, yes. All right. Very well, you may continue, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Your Honor, and I would like to follow up on, on one of those lines of questions. Uh, Dr. Lamb, why is it if the genetic connection is absolutely irrelevant <coughs> to childhood outcomes that so many couples pay uh, the money, to, the considerable expense to go through in vitro fertilization rather than adopt uh, one of the many children that needs to be adopted? Well, it certainly can be important to individuals, and, and um, uh, the fact that somebody would seek to engage in IVF using their own sperm and eggs would, would be an indication that it's important to them. Um, uh, again, the, the systematic research that, that we have on the adjustment of the children shows that uh, children raised conceived using IVF um, technologies are just as likely to be well adjusted as those conceived through natural conception, as those conceived with egg donation, as those conceived with donor insemination. So the, the data are as they, what they are. Well, now let's uh, return to the subjects we were discussing uh, before lunch, and, and let me ask you, uh, is it true that despite the diversity of gay fatherhood, research to date has, with some exceptions, been conducted, conducted with relatively homogeneous groups of participants? The research on gay fathers. Yes, sir. Um, uh, I think that the, the um, uh, research on gay fathers, which is, is certainly less extensive than that on lesbian mothers, has, I mean, it does include the population study that I mentioned to you earlier. Um, it does include um, recent studies of, of adoption by gays. So I, I'm not sure about the, the, the term homogeneous in this context. All right, well, let, let's look at uh, your fourth edition mm -hmm. of the role of the father in child development. This is 2004. It's behind tab 40 uh, in your binder. And I'd like to direct your attention to page 402. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, a chapter uh, written by Charlotte Patterson called Gay Fathers. And you, you have a high regard for Charlotte Patterson, correct? Yes. Okay. And, and turning to uh, page 402, the last full paragraph, it, it starts by saying, despite the diversity of gay fatherhood, research to date has, with some exceptions, been conducted with relatively homogeneous groups of participants. When Professor Patterson wrote that, that was an accurate statement, correct? I believe so, yes. And she continues, samples of gay fathers have been mainly Caucasian, well-educated, affluent, and living in major urban centers, and that's an accurate statement too, correct? That was, I believe, an accurate statement at the time, yes. Although the available evidence suggests that self-identified gay men are much more likely to live in large cities than elsewhere, the representativeness of the samples of gay fathers studied to date cannot be established. That's an accurate statement, true, correct? That was true then, yes. Most research has been cross-sectional in nature and has involved information provided through interviews and questionnaires by gay fathers themselves, correct? Yes. And her conclusion, caution in the interpretation of findings from research in this new area of work is thus required. And when you edited this book, you agreed with that statement, correct? It was an accurate statement in 1996, yes. No, this was uh, 2004. Okay, 2002. So this was a new area of research when you edited this book. Uh, that's correct. Okay. All right. Now, uh, let us uh, turn to some of the specifics of these 
studies. Uh, in, in fact, the literature on gay males and their parenting skills is so sparse that you're starting a study of your own in the United Kingdom, correct? I am starting a study of my own in the United Kingdom. That part's correct. And, and you're hoping to do a similar study in the United States, correct? Correct. And in your study, you're going to try to match the nature of the parents' prior relationships, correct? Well, you want to um, match as many issues as you can in order to um, refine the value of and informativeness of your study. That's correct. Okay. And so one of the factors you're going to focus on is the nature of the parents' prior relationships, correct? Right. But many of the studies you've relied on in your expert report, in this case, don't attempt to match the prior relationships of parents, correct? Some do and some don't. That's correct. We know that economic resources are an important factor in the psychological well-adjustment of children, correct? Yes, I testify. It's correct. And you would agree that if you had two households, and in the first <coughs> household it had a combined income of $100,000, but only one child, and you had a second household that had a combined income of $100,000 but had 10 children, that the resources available to those children would be quite different, correct? That's correct. And in your study that you're doing in Great Britain, you're going to try to hold to control for that in your study, correct? But many of the studies you rely on for your opinions in this case don't control for that factor, correct? I think that's not correct. Some of them don't, isn't that correct? Some of them may not. Some of them don't even compare the uh, parenting outcomes to any control group. Isn't that right? Um, uh, not the studies that I would rely on to be in informing an understanding of the comparative differences. Well, the studies that are listed in your materials considered, some of them don't have any control group whatsoever. Isn't that right? That is right, yes. All right. Now, many of the studies, uh, you would agree that taking into account age gives you another proxy index of the degree to which an individual is ready to function as a parent, correct? Um, age of a parent can make a difference to parenting, yes. But many of the studies you rely on don't hold constant for age, correct? Um, uh, I'm not sure that's true, but maybe to some do. And, and some don't, though. You're just not sure of the state of the literature, whether they can... Well, I'm, I'm trying to really understand your question. I mean, because the, there's quite a large literature on the effects of parental age, um, and it identifies certain groups as problematic, and there is fairly large um, portions of the lifespan where you don't see differences associated with age. So what would be important in a situation is not to be mixing teen parents with mature parents, and likewise, not to focus on some of the difficulties that may occur when older people have to have children. Um, uh, so that, this is not something which is just linearly related to the ability to parent. In your study in Great Britain, you're going to be asking whether the parents are sexually exclusive, correct? Uh, I think I told you that we might do that, yes. As, again, as I told you, we're about to begin the study. And that becomes especially important because it's one of the issues that is sometimes raised in discussing children's adjustments, comma, correct? Well, the, the nature of the relationship between the parents is certainly one of the important issues, yes. And to the extent that sexual exclusivity was important to those parents and affected the quality of their relationship, then that could be an important issue. And that's why you're going to try to hold constant for it in the study you're conducting, correct? I just said, I'm not sure that we will, but I think when we discussed this at deposition, I said that that seemed like a reasonable issue to consider. And, but many of the studies you reply on, rely on have not held constant for the prior relationships of the parents who are studied, correct? That's true in studies of both heterosexual and homosexual parents, that's right. And your study that you're launching is probably going to be extended in the future so that you can look at developmental tra trajectories as the children pass through other portions of their lifespan, correct? Yes, it might be. But many of the studies you rely on are single-time snapshots and don't follow developmental trajectories, correct? Some of them are, yes. The study you're designing for the United Kingdom focuses on children who've been adopted at birth, correct? Uh, it will, yes. But many of the studies you look at, the children are the products of 
heterosexual unions, the children of the gay and lesbian couples, correct? Correct, and that's why you want to have different sorts of circumstances studied. And educational background, occupational choices, income available, these factors relate to aspects of parenting, so they're uh, important ones to consider, correct? To consider, yes. And most of the studies listed in your materials address white, middle-class lesbians, correct? Um, I think many of them do, that's correct. Several of the studies listed in your materials considered uh, don't have a con control group against which the parenting skills of gays and lesbians can be measured, correct? Uh, some of the studies don't have a comparison group of heterosexual parents because for the purpose of those studies, those weren't necessary. Uh, we know that the child outcomes are better on average for children raised by two parents rather than one, correct? On average, that's correct, yes. But many of the studies you rely on in forming your opinions in this case compare the children of lesbians to single mothers, correct? Some of them compare them to single mothers, some to um, uh, two-parent families. And some of them show that the children of the lesbian couples are only doing as well as the children of the single mothers, correct? Um, uh, some of them show that they're doing as well as the children of the lesbians. Uh, sorry, that, that the children being raised by lesbians and singles are similar, that's right. We also know from the literature that the presence of a stepfather can increase the likelihood of negative childhood outcomes, correct? Yes, the entry of any additional person into a child's rearing environment can have an influence. Many of the studies you rely on are not a comparison between married biological parents as compared to gay or lesbian parents, correct? I would hope so. What I tried to do is summarize a large body of research that studies lots of different types of families. In terms of outcomes, many studies look at educational attainment as a measure of childhood well-adjustment, correct? Um, to some extent, yes. In particular, with the level of things like completion of school, adequate schooling. Uh, and many of the studies uh, are of young children, so there's no meaningful track record of educational achievement, correct? Um, yeah, a variety of ages have been studied. And some of the studies that do attempt to measure educational attainment look to grade point averages, correct? Uh, some do, yes. But no, none of the studies try to compare the difficulty of the subject matters that the children are taking or the difficulty of their schools, correct? I think that's correct, yeah. Uh, and if you wanted to measure whether a child had reached his or her intellectual potential, you would want to compare their native intelligence, perhaps measured by IQ, and compare that to their grade point average or some other metric of educational attainment, correct? That would be nice. That tends not to be the case in most of the research that people do on educational attainment, regardless of the gender orientation of the parents. Right, and in fact, there's not one single one of the studies you rely on in this case which has tried to measure the educational attainment of these children as compared to their potential. Correct? Probably correct. And there is a fairly reliable association between family size and IQ, correct? It's not a very sizable correlation, but there's a reliable correlation. And having one sibling turns out to be quite positive, correct? Seems to have positive benefits, relatively small but reliable. But many of the studies listed in your expert report do not hold constant for the number of siblings, correct? Um, they may not hold it constant. Yes, that's, that's correct. Some of them don't. And for those that look at <coughs> educational attainment of children, um, and, and they, they look at college, there are some that look at college matriculation, is that right? I think that's correct, yes. But they, those studies don't try to measure the caliber of the university. They treat a degree from your university the same as a degree from a community college, correct? Um, I think a degree from a community college is usually distinguished, but yeah, going to, going to some, uh, further education is usually the marker. But they don't try to distinguish between, let's say, a four-year degree at Cambridge University and a four-year degree at a far less prestigious university, correct? That's correct. 
And it's important to be as precise as possible in making comparisons, correct? In a general rule, yes, of course. But the resources available to a child are an important variable in predicting childhood outcomes, correct? Yes. Absolutely. But not one of the studies you've looked at considers the resources that grandparents make available to children, correct? I think that's not correct. Some of them look at the financial resources that grandparents make available? You said resources. You didn't say financial resources. Certainly there have been studies about the extent of involvement uh, with, with uh, grandparent generations. And, yeah, and that's because grandparents can be important to a child's psychological adjustment, correct? Correct. But none of the studies you rely on take into account the financial resources that grandparents might make available to a child, correct? Uh, can I just, what, when you talk about none of the studies, we're talking about the thousands of studies of children's adjustment? We're, we're talking about the hundred or so studies about uh, same-sex parenting. Okay. Um, uh, I'm not sure that, that any of them have looked at financial transfers specifically. You, you can't identify a single one, correct? Not if I sit here today, no. And none of the studies look at the educational attainment of grandparents either, correct? Um, many of them do as part of the process of, of describing the backgrounds or origins of those individuals. Yeah. They look at uh, the, the uh, educational attainment of the grandparents? Or some, um, uh, something that would be related to that, some measures of social class background. Clearly we know that the psychological well-being of parents affects their ability to parent and affects the quality of the relationships they have with their children, correct? Oh, yes. But when it comes to minority stress syndrome that Dr. Meyer testified to, you're not familiar with that literature, correct? No, I'm not an expert in that literature. You would agree that lots of researchers have shown that being a depressed parent changes the way you behave and interact with your child, and that can indirectly affect the child's adjustment as well, correct? Yes, that's correct. Like you to turn to uh, tab 41 in your binder, <coughs> which is GIX 131. This is uh, the affidavit of Stephen Knox that was submitted to the Superior Court of Justice in Ontario as part of the Canadian same-sex marriage legal battle. And um, Professor Knox was a professor of sociology at the University of Virginia. Is that right? I uh, understand so. Yes. And uh, he was a well-known family sociologist, is that correct? Um, I know he was a family sociologist. Well, you, you, let's look at what you said during your deposition, page 243. You said at line 11, I know that he was a well-known family sociologist. Does that refresh your recollection? Yes. Okay. Um, and he's unfortunately deceased at the present, correct? I believe so, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, you told me so at the deposition. Yes, that's right. Um, I'd like to uh, direct your attention to page 7 of this document. And in particular to paragraph 20. And it says in the... Uh, last sentence of that paragraph. If a valid and scientifically adequate study were to show that there is no correlation between having gay or lesbian parents and a child's well-being based on a comparison of representative groups of each type of parent and differing only on sexual orientation, then most scientists would accept that there is no causal link between the two. Would you agree with that statement? Yes, I think so. All right. And turning your attention to the next uh, paragraph, um, in, in particular, sorry, to paragraph 22 under sampling, where he says, um, first and foremost, the ability of any social science evidence to apply to a larger group depends on the way the sample of cases was obtained. Would you agree with that statement? No, I wouldn't. Well, uh, I, I would agree that it is related to um, understanding and specifying how you obtained your sample. 
in, in the second sentence, he says, a probability sample is one in which every member of a definable population has a known probability of being included in the study. Do you agree with that? Yeah, that's what I was talking about when I called it a representative sample. All right. And then turning to paragraph 23, Mm -hmm. um, he, he states in the first sentence, a probability sample is required whenever a researcher wishes to make claims about the larger population from which the sample was drawn. Do you agree with that statement? Well, that's a sociologist's version. Psychologists don't usually do studies that way. Okay. Uh, and if the goal is to make general claims about same-sex parental relationships, and the children who might be affected by them, then we must have a probability sample drawn from the larger population of homosexual parents and children. Do you agree with Professor Knox's statement? Well, I would expand on his statement and say that we need many studies using a variety of different sampling procedures. And that's what I testified to this morning. Now, um, I'd like to uh, turn your attention to... Um, paragraph uh, 29, and in particular to the last full sentence on page 10. And it says, Professor Knox says, moreover, we do not have an agreed upon definition of homosexuality. Is a homosexual a person whose erotic interests are focused on those of the same sex? Is a homosexual a person who sometimes engages in sexual acts with a member of the same sex? Is a homosexual a person who thinks of him or herself as a homosexual? Does a single sexual act with a person of the same sex define a person as a homosexual? Also important in the case is how to define bisexual. Are bisexuals to be treated as homosexuals, heterosexuals, or both? And how does one decide? Is homosexually learned, i.e. socially constructed, or is it transmitted genetically? Finally, is male homosexually the same phenomenon as female homosexually? Answers to such questions have direct and important consequences for one how investigates the topics in this case. Would you agree that coming to a settled definition of homosexuality so that you can at least define the relevant population is important for social science looking into these sorts of issues? I think neither Steve Knock nor myself are experts on homosexuality. Certainly in the literature that explores the effects of parenting, the um, uh, issues are focused on self-definition of individuals as either same-sex oriented or opposite sex oriented. Now I, I'd like to direct your attention um, to the, well, let me ask you this. In order to determine the specific characteristics of the father-child relationship affect certain aspects of the child's personality, it is necessary to use those correlational strategies that permit causal inferences, such as crossed lagged panel correlations, to supplement experimental and quasi-experimental studies. Would you agree with that statement? Yes, I think that's another statement of my belief that you need to use multiple techniques and multiple approaches in order to understand a phenomenon. All right, now I'd like to direct your attention to um, page 18 of the Knock Affidavit. Please let me know when you're there. Yep, I'm there. In, in addition to identifying and obtaining a sample, a researcher must identify how information... Sorry, can you tell me where this is? Well, let, uh, let me just add a question and could see if we need to get into the details of this in a moment. Um, would you agree that in addition to identifying and obtaining a sample, a researcher must determine how information is to be obtained from the sample? Is that right? All right. And uh, in, in, when uh, Professor Knox says in the first uh, sentence of paragraph 49, before gathering a single datum from a sample, one must first translate the concepts of interest into indicators that can be measured. Would you agree with that? Yes. And when he goes on to say, this is a central part of the entire process of designing the data gathering procedure, would you agree? Yes. Sometimes the project calls for a questionnaire survey. Would you agree? So, yes. 
Typically, in such cases, the concepts to be investigated are translated into specific questions on a questionnaire. Would you agree? If you were going to use a questionnaire, you certainly have to write it. That's correct. Yes. And, and these are important parts of uh, determining the reliability and validity of a study. Is that right? I'm not sure that that follows from what you said, but it is certainly important to establish the reliability and validity of whatever measures you use. That is correct. Um, Your Honor, at this point, we'd ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 131. Very well. And, uh, Professor, I'd like to direct your attention to um, tab 44. This is a document entitled No Basis, What the Studies Don't Tell Us About Same-Sex Parenting by Robert Lerner and Althea Nagai. And have you reviewed, did you review this document in connection with your testimony in this case? Uh, I have read this document in the past. I don't think I have read it in connection with this case, no. But you have read it in the past? Mm-hmm. Okay, Your Honor, uh, we'd move the, uh, we'd ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 734. Well, I'll do that if you ask him a question about okay. it. Okay. We're proceeding under 803.18, I believe it is. Okay. Uh, and, uh, Professor, the, the uh, conclusion that uh, Dr. Lerner reached is that the same-sex parenting literature was not uh, sufficiently reliable to draw conclusions one way or the other about uh, the parenting skills and abilities of same-sex couples. Is that right? That was the conclusion he reached then, in that this was about a 10-year-old document. But yes. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, now, Your Honor, we would request uh, the court to take judicial notice. That would be fine. Thank you, Your Honor. Oh, yes, of DIX 734. And, um, Dr. Lamb, turning to the next tab in your binder, uh, 45, this is an article by Walter Shum of Kansas State University. What was really learned from Tasker and Gollenbuch's study of lesbian and single parent mothers. Um, have you uh, reviewed this article ever? Um, uh, yes, I have. I've seen this before. Uh, it's published in a journal um, uh, where one has to pay to have articles published, so it's not usually considered part of the scientific literature. But since he was involved in some previous cases, I saw it in that context. Yes, you've uh, squared off against Professor Shum in some other cases, is that right? I have seen him there, yes. Yes, okay. Um, and um, he says at the end of this uh, document, he says, policymakers should interpret research on gays and family life or on any very small subset, subset of any population with extreme caution. Um, and would you agree at least that when you're talking about a very small subset of any population, a researcher should proceed with caution. Could you repeat the question? Yes. Would you I think researchers should always proceed with caution um, and make sure that there is adequate basis for whatever conclusions that they draw. Your Honor, we would request that the court take judicial notice of DIX 779. Very well. Then uh, turning to the next tab in your binder, uh, 46, this is Families with Young Children, a review of research in the 1990s. And um, ha have you reviewed this document in connection with the case? Uh, no, I have not. All right. I I'd like to ask you to turn to page 889. Let me know when you're there. Okay. And uh, looking at the right-hand column, the last paragraph, second uh, sentence says, one relatively new line of inquiry is the development and adjustment of children living in families headed by lesbian, gay, or bisexual parents. And then if we skip down... Hey, where are you reading from? Oh, where, on uh, yes, Your Honor, it's, the, uh, it's the last paragraph on the page, <coughs> uh, the second sentence. Uh, one I relatively, guess. yes, Thank you. Okay, certainly. And then turning to the, uh, skipping down to the last 
excuse me, the second to last sentence on the page, it says, a persistent limitation of these studies, however, is that most rely on small samples of white, middle class, previously married lesbians and their children. And at least at the time this was written, that was a true statement, wasn't it? I think that that's a true statement as a um, description of the majority of the studies at that time. That's true. And, and they conclude, as a result, we cannot be confident concerning the generalizability of many of the findings. And that's a fair point, isn't it? Well, it continues to talk about um, a more broad question there. Well, let me just ask it as a question. Based on the concern, the persistent limitation they've just identified, would you agree that we cannot be confident concerning the generalizability of many of the findings? If, the, if you are, you would have to be careful about that if you were relying on a relatively small um, body of research that involved only a small group of individuals or homogeneous, sorry, a more homogeneous set of individuals. All right, and um, Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 749. Very well. Uh, turning to tab 47 in your binder, uh, Dr. Lamb, this is an article, Does the Sexual Orientation of Parents Matter? And it's by Judith Stacy of the University of Southern California and a colleague of hers. And um, are you familiar with Professor Stacy's work at all? Yes. And she's an advocate for the rights of gays and lesbians, correct? I don't know about that, but... All right, let's um, turn to uh, page 168 of this document, and in particular, footnote 9. And she uh, has just, uh, in the text, she's, she's talked about uh, that there are studies showing uh, greater gender conformity, uh, well, I will read the sentence to which footnote 9 is appended. However, on other measures such as occupational go goals and sartorial so styles, they, and this means I believe the children of, of lesbians, also exhibit greater gender conformity. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. I <coughs> don't find that in paragraph 9. Am I missing something? Oh, uh, Your Honor, uh, I, let me try this again. Page 168. Um, it is the last paragraph on the page, and uh, I, the point I want to focus on is footnote 9. And um, reading, You were reading from the text. Though. I was reading from the text just to try to give the context, and I think I didn't back up far enough. Right. Uh, but Prof uh, Dr. Lamb, why don't you read the text to which footnote 9 is appended, and then I will ask you a question about footnote 9. Sons appear to respond in more complex ways to parental sexual orientations. On some measures like aggressiveness and play preferences, the sons of lesbian mothers behave in less traditionally masculine ways than those raised by heterosexual single mothers. However, on other measures such as occupational goals and sartorial dials, they also exhibit greater gender conformity than do daughters with lesbian mothers, but they are not more conforming than sons with heterosexual mothers and it is a citation to two studies, one by Richard Green and the other by um, Steckel. And then in, in the footnote it says, many of these studies use conventional levels of significance on minuscule samples, substantially increasing, increasing their likelihood of failing to reject the null hypothesis. Is Professor Stacy right that if you use a minuscule sample, you substantially increase the likelihood of failing to reject the null hypothesis? Yes. All right. And she concludes this footnote by saying, for very small samples, conventional levels of statistical significance she's referring to can actually be too restrictive. Would you agree with that statement? Uh, yes. Uh, Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX, 1394. Very well. <clears throat> uh, turning to tab 48 in your binder, Dr. Lamb, this is uh, DIX 782. It's entitled Science and Advocacy Issues in Research on Children of Gay and Lesbian Parents, um, and it's written by Virginia Schiller of Yale uh, University. Um, and, and she writes, uh, in the very last sentence 
on the page, the first page, given that opponents make egregious statements about the unfitness of gay and lesbian parents and the pathology of their children, are we justified in lowering our standards about how, how scientific research is described and reported? And would you agree uh, with the proposition that scientific standards have been lowered in this area precisely because of the need to combat uh, prior bias in the medical community against gays and lesbians? I don't know anything about the medical community, but I don't think it's true of the research that I'm familiar with. You don't think uh, that there was bias previously in the psychological community against gays and lesbians? I understood you to be asking me to comment on a specific um, sense. Well, maybe you want to ask the question again. Perhaps no, that, that, that's all right. We can move on. <coughs> I'd like to turn your attention to uh, the uh, next tab, which is 49. This is a document uh, entitled Children in Three Contexts. Uh, family education and social development. And this is a document that concludes that the children of uh, gays and lesbians do less well, have worse outcomes than the children of heterosexuals. Is that correct? It is, yes. Uh, right. But you ignored this study in your opening report in this case, correct? It wasn't something you even considered, was it? Well, I didn't list it. Um, uh, as I think I pointed out in my report, I tried to consider thousands of <coughs> contributions to the literature. Um, I certainly didn't list all the things that I was um, taking into account. This study is a complete outlier from the rest of the research. Um, uh, and by the author's own admission, it contains uh, problems in the design and interpretation that make it very hard to justify the conclusion that the author reaches. It has a larger sample size than any of the uh, gay parenting literature that you cite to, isn't that right? Absolutely not. W which of your articles in your materials considered has a larger sample size than, with respect to, that compares uh, the childhood outcomes of the children of gays and lesbians as compared to heterosexuals? Well, the largest sample, of course, is the Rosenfeld one, um, which is the national sample. Um, uh, and that one was not in my initial report um, because I wasn't aware of it at that time. This one does in include a total of uh, 58 children um, uh, being raised by lesbians and, and gay parents. Yes, and then it has a control group, correct? It has um, two comparison groups, in fact. One is um, uh, married heterosexuals and one of cohabiting heterosexuals. Your Honor, we would move, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 775. Very well. All right, turning to uh, tab 50, this is entitled Parenting and Planned Lesbian Families, and this was one of the studies you considered uh, in forming your opinions in this case. Is that right? That's right. And uh, If we look to page uh, 68, I'd ask you to, to look at. I know this, is, this is incomplete. Is it that intentional? Uh, yes, we just <coughs> wanted to, notwithstanding the heft of these binders, we wanted to kill one last tree. But, um, Let's see, so turning to uh, page 68, uh, it, it concludes under differences in parental behavior, the last sentence on that page, difference, these differences indicate that lesbian biological mothers scored lower on structure and limit setting than did the heterosexual mothers. And you would agree that setting limits is an important parenting skill, correct? I agree, yes. All right. Let's turn to this. Uh, this is not the only area in which setting limits would be helpful. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that, Your Honor. 
it's unfortunately an extensive literature, as the doctor said. Um, turning to uh, uh, tab 51, uh, this is another one of the studies you relied on. Is that correct? Um, I think this is a report drawn from the one that we just talked about. Okay, and it does not uh, explicitly say that it's comparing the uh, childhood outcomes of same-sex couples with married biological parents, correct? This one does not, know. Okay, and let's, uh, Your Honor, we would ask the court to uh, take judicial notice of PX 1055. Very well. 1055. Then uh, turning to tab 52 in your binder, this is PX 1075, and this is another document that you uh, relied upon, is that right? I believe so, yes. Okay, and um, this one looked at only young children, is that correct? Um, at this point, yes. And um, again, this study did not compare childhood outcomes of the children of same-sex couples with the children of married biological uh, parents, correct? I think that's correct, yes. All right, let's turn to... The, uh, Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX 1075. You're asking the question about the exhibit. Oh, that's that's the precondition oh, for I think. Uh, well, judicial notice under 803, uh, eight, some paragraph 18. Yes, yes, Your Honor. Um, well, uh, the the uh, this study. Um, I guess the question, Your Honor, I, I had a, I'm trying to ask is that it doesn't compare with, with these, to try to speed things up, my main question to him is going to be that these studies don't actually compare the, the children of married biological parents to same-sex couples. And so that's really the question. I'm, I'm, I'm getting him to prove a negative in the sense of, uh, but uh, you yeah, witness. I'm yeah, I, witness. I, I apologize, Your Honor. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, but Dr. Lamb, just to be clear, uh, the comparison group here uh, is uh, not of married biological parents. There's nothing in this study you can point to that would uh, establish that comparison group, correct? Oh, I'm sure that neither you nor the judge wants me to read it through to check. Um, uh, my understanding is that they didn't uh, exclude people depending on whether or not they were married. Okay. Um, and, and I would ask... All right. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Your Honor. Uh, that would be... be taken of 1075. Thank you, you Your Honor. move on. Okay. Uh, tab 53, uh, PX 115. Again, this one did not have a control group of married biological parents, correct? It had a comparison group of heterosexual parents. Um, as, as my understanding was, they didn't exclude people who were not married in the heterosexual group. Your Honor, we would uh, ask the court to take judicial notice of 1115. Very well. Uh, turning to tab 54, Dr. Lamb, uh, this is one of the studies you relied on in this case. Is that right? PX 1072? Oh, okay. Ten. Yes. Okay, and it too did not uh, have a control group of married biological parents, correct? Well, it had a comparison group of heterosexuals again. Um, uh, I don't know, as, as I'm trying to respond to you quickly here, whether they um, excluded people in the heterosexual group who were not married. So, so you just don't know uh, how many of these studies compared married biological, the children of married biological parents to the children of same-sex couples? It was comparing um, people being raised by their heterosexual uh, parents with individuals being raised by lesbian couples. That was the focus of these studies, as I recall. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX 1072. Very well. Turning to tab 55, Dr. Lamb, this is PX 1049. And this is another um, study that you considered in forming your opinions in this case, correct? This is, sorry, which one? This is under tab 55? Yes, sir. The, the adoption study? This is one, yes. And uh, it, too, does not have a control group of married biological parents, correct? 
Um, again, I believe that it compared, it did not exclude people who were not married from the heterosexual group. Okay. To the best of my recollection. And turning, uh, Your Honor, we would ask the uh, court to take judicial notice of PX 1049. Very well. Turning to tab 56, Dr. Lamb, this is PX 1088. This is a document you considered in connection with this case, correct? Correct. And it, too, does not have a control group of married biological parents, correct? Um, I believe that's correct, that they did not exclude people who were not married. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX 1088. Well, Turning to tab 57, Dr. Lamb, this is PX 1066. This is another document you considered in connection with this case. Is that right? That's right. And it does not uh, have a control group of uh, married biological parents, correct? Like the others, it did not exclude people in the heterosexual group who were not married. All right, and I'd like to direct your attention to page 27 of this document, the second column. And tell me when you're there. 27, second column, yes, I'm there. Okay, so it says in the first sentence of the second column, five of the 38 rated children in lesbian mother families, 13%, were classified as showing psychiatric disorder. One with uh, conduct disorder, one with conduct and emotional disorder, two with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and one with developmental disorder, compared with 12 of the 14, uh, 12 of the 134 children in heterosexual families, 9%. So this is a study that you relied on that it, on this metric of psychiatric disorder shows the children of gays and lesbians at almost a 50% greater risk. Is that right? Uh, no, actually, if you read the preceding sentence, it says there were no differences between the children in these two groups. That difference that you just referred to is not statistically significant. Oh, 50% isn't statistically significant because it's such a tiny sample size, is that it? No, it's not statistically significant. Because it's a small sample size, right? Because the difference isn't large enough to be statistically significant. Sample size is one of the factors that determine statistical significance. The second is the magnitude of the difference. Right, and here it was 50%, but that's not enough because the sample is so small, right? It's not any... statistically significant. It's not a difference. Not a statistically significant difference. That's correct. Yes. And uh, therefore, it's not reliable. It's not a difference in terms of the literature. Uh, Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX 1066. Very well. Uh, turning to tab 58 in your binder. This is a, a PX 1061. It's a document you relied upon in reaching your uh, conclusions in this case. Is that right? That's right. And it uh, doesn't compare the outcomes of married biological parents to the outcomes of uh, the children of same-sex couples, correct? Again, to the best of my knowledge, they did not exclude people um, who were not married from the heterosexual comparison group. Your Honor, we would uh, ask the court take judicial notice of uh, PX 1061. Turning to tab 59, this is PX 1073, and it's a document that you uh, considered in reaching your conclusions in this case. Is that correct? That's correct. And it did not control for married biological parents, correct? It did not exclude unmarried biological parents from the heterosexual group. Is that... Your Honor, we would ask the court to take a judicial notice... Wait a minute. Um, this was asking for a clarification oh, of the question. Sorry. What was the question? My question is, is the control group uh, married biological parents, and their children? And I understood you to say that, uh, no, it's not, because uh, it was all heterosexuals and unmarried hadn't been exclu excluded. 
to the best of my knowledge, and I, you're not, I don't have time to read through them, I think that's correct. Yes. So that in, in all of these cases, uh, certainly from the early eras, the majority of them would have been married, but the um, unmarried ones were, so far as I recall, not excluded from those. Very well. Uh, Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of PX 1073. Very well. Turning to tab 60, this is PX 1160, and this is a document that you considered in connection with this case. Is that right? That's right. And um, it uh, does not have a control group of married biological parents, correct? It, again, did not exclude people who were not married. All right. As far as I recall. And I'd like to turn your attention to uh, the uh, page 787, which appears in small font in the upper right-hand corner of these pages. It's about the fifth page of the exhibit. Uh, sorry, sixth page of the exhibit. And do you see the chart that says Table 2, Group Comparisons on Measures of Children's Emotions, Behavior, and Relationships? Mm-hmm. And in I the do. fourth row down, it says Cognitive Competence. Can you see that? Oh, on the second table, yes. Yes. And uh, can you help us out what uh, the uh, vertical column that means X, what that stands for? There's a... So there's an N, an X, and an SE, and is the N the number of people in the sample? Yeah, the N should be the number of people, the X should be the mean score, and the SE would be the standard error for measure. Okay, and so we see for the heterosexual two parents, the cognitive competence of their children was higher than the cognitive competence of the children of the single heterosexual mothers. Is that right? That appears to be true in the sample, yes. And that the and it's also higher than the children of the lesbian mother families, correct? Well, you've got the comparisons at the end, so, and one of those differences seems not to be significant, and the other is. And the one for the uh, lesbian families is statistically significant, correct? Less than trying to understand what the what the. Um, well, it's certainly a worse outcome, isn't it? Which, in this case, it seems to be, yes. All right. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take uh, judicial notice of PX 1160. 1160 or 50? 60. Very well. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, turning to tab 61, this is uh, PX 1065. And this is a document you considered in connection with this case. Is that right? That's right. And this document does not have a control group of married biological parents, correct? Um, it's a follow-up of one of the other studies you already, uh, groups you already asked me about. So I think the answer is the same here. All right. Very well, Your Honor. We ask the court to take judicial notice of PX 1065. Very well. Um, Turning to tab 62, this is PX 1081, and this is a study that you relied upon, correct? Sorry, good to catch up. Um, 1081? Yes, sir. Yes. yes. All right, and it does not have a control group of married biological parents, correct? That's correct. All right, and uh, Your Honor, we would ask the court to uh, take judicial notice of PX 1081. Very well. Turning to tab 63, this is another study that you relied on uh, in connection with this case. It's PX 1092, is that correct? Yes. And it does not have as a control group married biological parents, correct? I think that's correct. Um, uh, again, the, the same point I made earlier. Yes, I think that's correct. Your Honor, we'd ask the court to take judicial notice of PX 1092. Very well. Turning to tab 64, this is PX 1428, and this is one of the studies you relied upon in this case. Is that right? I'd still be familiar with it. I don't remember as I sit here whether I listed it, but yes. 
All right, and it uh, doesn't have as a control group married biological parents, correct? That may be correct. It, again, um, uh, yes, that's correct. All right, Your Honor, we'd ask the court to take judicial notice of PX 1428. Oh. Uh, turning to tab 65, this is PX 1427. And it doesn't, you considered this uh, document in connection with your opinions in this case, right, Dr. Lamb? That's correct. And it does not have as a control group married biological parents, correct? As far as I can tell, this is a literature review rather than a, a study. But maybe it does, no, it becomes a study. It focuses on the results of one of the studies that I think we've already talked about. Uh, and again, um, uh, it's probably the case that they did not exclude from the heterosexual group people who were not married. All right, and turning to tab 66, this is another one of the uh, studies that you relied upon in this case, correct? It's yes. Oh, and I believe in my haste, uh, I forgot to ask the court, Your Honor, please, um, to uh, take judicial notice of PX 1427. Uh, turning to tab 66, Dr. Lamb, um, this is PX 1079, and this is a document you considered, correct? That's correct. And it doesn't have as a control group married biological parents, correct? That's correct. Your Honor, we'd ask the court to take judicial notice of PX 1079. Well? Turning to tab 67, this is another study that you relied upon in this case. Is that uh, right, Dr. Lamb? That's correct. And it doesn't have as a control group married biological parents, correct? Again, they did not exclude people um, who were not married. I think that almost all of the people in the comparison group were married. Uh, Your Honor, this is uh, PX 1125, and we would request that judicial notice be taken of it. If that same question applies to all of these, perhaps you can uh, <laughs> summarize them in some fashion? Is that, uh, uh, well, the, 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 the only uh, point, Your Honor, is that Dr. Lamb likes to talk about this rich, deep literature, and we want to show that he doesn't have any studies that are married biological parents, which is our core position in this case, that that's the optimum environment for raising Oh, okay, and, and counsel, uh, I apologize, counsel, counsel, but... Counsel, we're, we're, we're trying a case. Yes. Is there a way to short, shorten the presentation of the point that you're trying to make with these documents by putting them all in together and... Um, one question with respect to a whole group. Well, maybe we could... Um, we could just... I could get him to confirm that uh, each one of these he looked at and then ask him one question at the end and get them all in. Would that be all right? Same question with respect yes. to each. Maybe yes. that would be helpful. Okay. And there may be one or two variants in the middle. But all right. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. That's a very good suggestion. Um, uh, so, Professor Lamb, uh, PX uh, 1133 is a document you considered. Is that right? 11, sorry, PX 1131 behind tab 68. Yes. All right. And, um, Your Honor, may I ask that judicial notice be taken along the way? Why don't that at the end? Okay. I'll make a list. Okay. And PX uh, 1083 was a document relied upon in connection with, with, with the witness's the, testimony? With the witness's testimony. Is that right, Dr. Lamb? It's behind tab 69. So this is 1131, are we talking about? No, you want to go to the next one. Yes, we're just asking you, with respect to each, whether uh, this is something you considered in connection with the case. I'm familiar with these studies, yes. Okay, and then let's go to tab 70, which is PX 1116. Mm -hmm. And this group, did, oh, uh, and you considered this in connection with this case, is that right? Yes. And let's go to tab 71, which is PX 778, and it does not have a, uh, it, you, you consider this document, correct? Yes. And let's go to tab 72, it's PX 1111, um. and you consider this document in this case, correct? Yes. 
And let's go to tab 73, it's PX 1049. And you relied upon this document in this case, correct? Yes. And let's go to tab 74. <coughs> and, uh, well, actually, I think these next tabs uh, we can actually probably just skip. Um, so let me ask you, uh, Dr. Lamb, with respect to all the studies we just looked at, isn't it true that none of them had as a control group married biological parents? I think most of them had as a control group married biological parents, but they, for the most part, but that they, so far as I remember, not having a chance to review these papers, that they did not exclude people on the grounds that they were not married. Right, so if you don't exclude someone who's not married, that means the control group could have unmarried people in it. That's what I'm saying, yes. Yes, okay. Um, Your Honor, we will skip uh, many of these tabs. Uh, and uh, with the court's permission, we have one last binder, which will not take long. Uh, I think with this new procedure we have in place to work through it expeditiously. Can right. we pass that out? So I can put away this one? Council? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, we uh, Now, now we've also we've been looking at a lot of individual studies, but you also relied on some so-called meta-analyses. Is that right? I think there was only one meta-analysis, but maybe there were more than that. There, there have been several meta-analyses, especially in the uh, research on adopted children. And can you explain what a meta-analysis is? A meta-analysis is a procedure to combine the results of multiple studies in order to. Uh, assess the reliability of findings, um, recognizing the fact that from one study to another you often have minor variations in results. You'll sometimes have a result in one study that is not repeated in others, and it's important to get a sense of the whole rather than to overemphasize those local variations. All right, and uh, tab 83, which is the first tab in this finder, is PX1090. Do you see that, sir? Yes. All right, and this uh, is a document we considered in connection with this case, is that right? Uh, probably. I, I don't specifically remember this one, but it probably did. Yeah. It, it was listed in your materials considered, I'll represent to you. Um, and isn't it true that this meta-analysis, uh, none of the studies that it surveys have a, a married biological uh, parents as the control group. And we've attached all of them to this, all that we haven't already looked at. We've looked at, mo since these are summaries and surveys, we've looked at most of the literature already, but any that we haven't already covered, we attach to this. And it isn't the point that there isn't a single study referenced in this survey that has as its control group married biological parents. I'm a little confused, and maybe I've got the wrong binder. I don't have a meta-analysis as the paper that you're talking about. 
isn't it uh, this, well, this uh, Baytons and Brayways? Okay, so this is a, a short literature review. It's not okay. a meta-analysis. Okay. So, so we are talking about the same piece. Okay, but it, it's a literature review. Okay. And, and the literature, and that's what I meant. So maybe we'll just say review rather than meta-analysis. This review, uh, none of the studies that it reviews have married biological parents as the uh, control group, isn't that right? Again, um, uh, I, don't, I, I don't want to attest to that affirmatively. It's my understanding that um, uh, the researchers listed in this reference list probably did not exclude from the comparison group people who were um, not married. And um, let's look at your uh, at the next tab, which is tab 84. And this is another uh, summary, is that right? It's another review, as it says at the top, yes. Yes, and, and none of the articles that are reviewed in this document had married biological parents as the control group, correct? Um, uh, that's probably true with the same qualifications I just gave you. All right, and just so the record's clear, we're talking about PX 1091. Um, and then turning to tab 85, this is PX 1123. This is another material you considered in connection with the case, correct? And that's correct. This is another literature review. Right, and none of the studies in this review had married biological parents uh, as the control group, correct? Um, that's probably correct. All right. Let's turn to, and, and for the record complete, that was PX 1123. Let's turn to tab 86. That's PX 1089. This is another document you considered in connection with this case. Is that right? It's another literature review, yes. And there's not one of the studies that was reviewed in, in this survey that had a control group that was uh, married biological parents, correct? Wait, I'm sorry, there's, there's two with the, under this tab. Oh, oh. Oh, I see, you've got other things attached. Well, what we did was, mo most of the things that are surveyed, mm -hmm. we've already talked about, but there were a couple that weren't, and um, so we're not trying to give you a memory test, but we just want to make sure the record is complete. Uh, that uh, none of the articles surveyed in this uh, uh, piece uh, had married biological parents as the control group, correct? Again, as I, I suspect that they did not exclude people on that basis. Okay. And turning to tab uh, 87, which is PX 1064, uh, they did not exclude uh, unmarried people from their control group, correct? That's is probably true. I, I mean, again, I don't know. You, you're asking me in a very rapid frame to talk about a, long, a large number of studies. I would be, um, I would suspect that most of these individuals didn't exclude individuals for that reason. Um, and let's let's turn to. Uh, tab 89, which is PX 1384. This is another literature review you relied upon. Yeah. It too did not have a control group of uh, married biological parents, correct? Well, this is a very long literature review, which also includes some studies by, um, by Kurdek, who certainly did, um, and some of the titles here specifically re refer to heterosexual married and not. So in this case, I feel comfortable saying that, that what you said is not true. Well, and, and this is uh, Kurdek, though, isn't he studying the parents? Well, he's studying couples, but that's... Studying the couples, but he's not looking at childhood outcomes, is he? That's correct. This is, a, this is a review article about family relationships you just gave me. Right. I, I just want the record to be clear that you're not identifying a study that measures childhood outcomes of same-sex couples as opposed to married biological in connection with this 
uh, document, correct? Yes, that's right. All right. Then let's turn to uh, tab <coughs> 90. This is Parenting and Child Development, PX 810. Is that correct? Oh, I have it. Sorry. 89 we're on? No, 90, sorry. Yes, okay. All right. And um, there, the literature that's reviewed in this document doesn't have uh, married biological parents as the control group, correct? Again, yes, it's reviewing most of the same studies, and uh, as I said before, I suspect that most people did not exclude individuals for that reason. All right, and uh, turning to tab 91, PX 1093, again, none of the articles that are surveyed in this survey uh, had married biological parents as the control group, correct? I think that's correct. And turning to um, tab 92, PX 1130, same answer, none of the uh, uh, materials or articles surveyed in this uh, document you considered had married biological as a control group. And so, are we talking about the Kurdic article? This is about gay and lesbian couples. It's not about parents at all. Okay. Well, I just want to make clear that this is not, you're not relying on this article for your same sex, uh, for the notion that the childhood outcomes uh, of gays and lesbians, uh, their, their children would be the same as um, for uh, married biological parents, correct? Well, this is a, a review, a very short review of the literature on the dynamics of relationships between gays and lesbians and heterosexuals and uh, different sorts of, of uh, family structures. The relevance of this is that it shows that the dynamics of those different families um, are very similar regardless of whether the individuals are same-sex or heterosexual. But none of the studies that are reviewed here are themselves studies that focus on adjustment of children. I think that's the case. Yes. You're not aware of any study that looks at the specific benefits flowing to children whose parents are together under domestic partnership law in California, correct? I don't have any study of that, though. And we don't have any studies that look at the behavioral outcomes for children with married same-sex parents, correct? Correct. And on aggregate, the children being raised by gays and lesbians are comparable in their outcomes to those being raised by heterosexual parents, correct? Sorry, could you repeat that? On aggregate, the children being raised by gays and lesbians are comparable in their outcomes to those being raised by heterosexual parents, correct? That's correct. And that's true even though none of those gay and lesbian couples were married, correct? That's correct. Thank you. No further questions. Here. Very well, Mr. McGill, redirect. Your Honor, uh, Dr. Lamb, do you need a break? Are you all right? Uh, well, I, I see the end in sight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at that all. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Let's warm up our time machine and go way back in time before that cross-examination.